Welcome back to Switch to Linux. Well, today we want to talk a little bit about why people are not adopting Windows 11 and uh, just kind of looking at the number of computers still running Windows 10. And uh, one article uh, focused on a guy that says, hey, I'm going to set up Windows with everything they want. And then question, can you turn some of these things off? Then we're actually going to look at Linux and what you can do with that. So uh, stay tuned. Thanks for checking out this video by Switch to Linux. If you like this type of content, subscribe to the channel if you've not already done so. Leave us a like and a comment down below and share the video far and wide. So today we are going to have a look at a couple of articles here. And uh, one of these looks at uh, the Dell earnings call, which suggests there's still a billion PCs remaining on Windows 10 and questioning that, uh, you know, what would it take? And basically look at this thing. Hey, look at this opportunity. We have a billion computers to convert to Windows 11. Uh, the problem is, I think many of those billion computers, the people are like, I don't want Windows 11. <laughs> And that's kind of the fundamental problem. So let's go ahead and have a look. Uh, we'll start over with the uh, uh, article here. Nearly a billion PCs remain on Windows 10. Has Windows 11 hit an adoption wall? And so they say here, roughly 1 billion PCs are not running it, according to an earnings call from Dell. So they say here, a billion PCs still running the uh, uh, Windows 10. They say here, uh, we have about 500 million of them capable of running Windows 11, Windows 11 that have not been upgraded. And we have another 500 million that are four years old that can't run Windows 11. Uh, these are rich tech, all rich opportunities to upgrade towards Windows 11 and modern technology. So this guy here at Dell's like, look at this opportunity. We have a billion computers not running Windows 11. Uh, that's a billion people who don't want it. Do you not realize this, Mr. Dell executive? Uh, but again, these guys are kind of out of touch. Now, the question becomes, why do... Uh, why do people not want it? Well, the problem is, is that we have a lot of these fundamental issues. Uh, we have a TPM 2.0 requirement. We have the uh, online account only requirements. There's uh, your computers being encrypted and most people don't realize it. Although I don't think that's holding too many people back because they don't even know it's doing it until they need their data and can't get it. Okay. Uh, good luck. It's, it's all in your Microsoft account. It's it's secured by your TPM 2.0 module. Uh, my TPM 2.0 module has disappeared. Well, sorry. <laughs> we can access your data. You can't. You know, that's kind of the, the funny thing. But uh, this guy here, um, Ben Wilson, he sets, he says he accepted all of Microsoft suggested Windows 11 setup settings with a fresh ISO, force online, extra telemetry included. Can any of it be bypassed? Very interesting. So Windows 11 comes with more preset apps than some argue are necessary, but at least searching terminal finds the terminal. That's useful because you have to have that thing in order to use your Windows computer in the way people want it to use it, which is funny because a lot of people are like, I don't want to use Linux. You have to use a terminal. It's scary. And then they sit there and tell you how you can just simply run a PowerShell, uh, PowerShell script to get your Windows computer working great again. Uh, it doesn't compute. I don't know. It's whatever. Uh, but anyway, uh, latest version 25H2 did not change much except getting rid of a lot of the ways that you could set up your computer without an internet connection. He does say here that uh, like many people working in computers, he does keep a 24H2 ISO, installable ISO floating around. So if he needs to reinstall Windows, he can do that on the local only account and then upgrade to 25H2. Uh, but here uh, he's looking at uh, people are um, what are the choices people have? And I think that's one of the, the fundamental problems. So hardware res uh, restrictions such as 2.0 requirement are causing some people to not switch. And I think this is really stupid. See, here's the thing. The TPM 2.0 requirement is a very, it is a very useful feature. It is a good overall feature, but it's a good overall feature for an enterprise that has a professional technology team that understands what the technology is, where it is, how it works. A home user is not that. A home user, see, the problem is they're trying to streamline it. They're trying to make it super easy. You don't have to remember a password. Just a simple pin, which is tied to this individual computer. Awesome. Very good. The problem is, is that the average person doesn't know what that means. They don't know that their computer their accounts don't even have passwords anymore. They don't know they cannot access those accounts anywhere but that one device tied to a passkey in that one module. And they don't know if that module dies. They are out of luck. 
because Microsoft is even trying to just tie your Microsoft account to that module uh, because you don't need anything else. I mean, come on. Anything else is a security risk, really. So when that chip dies and you need access to your data, well, good luck with that. I, guess, I mean, you could probably just pony up some identification documents to Microsoft that they would love to slurp up from you. I mean, you could always do that to try and get your account back. But actually, I don't even know if uh, that's even going to help you. I have uh, a few different friends who've lost Microsoft accounts over the years, and they all basically say, yeah, you just enter AI hell and you can't get out. So just create a new Microsoft account. So everything you put in there is gone, all because of the TPM 2.0 requirement, which should not be a requirement for home users. It should be optional. It should be there for people who understand it, who want to utilize that technology, but it should not be forced upon us because there are limitations to it, including the limited knowledge that your basic home users have. Obviously, the e-waste concern is big. Many people are not just going to throw away their computer because their Windows 10 gave them a pop-up that says this is end of life. So they're going to continue on with insecure systems because, hey, in this economy, we don't have thousands and thousands of dollars. I'm not sure if you've noticed, but the RAM prices have doubled over the last couple of months because AI is buying up all of the RAM now. And so getting a new computer, just a low spec new computer to run whatever you want to run on Windows 11 is going to cost you money you don't have when people are putting their groceries on Klarna and credit cards, which is a fundamental problem. So why send all these computers to e-waste, particularly when you're already committing to supporting Windows 10 with security updates for three years anyway? And I know I could get it without paying for it. I mean, I just got to give them data, connect my computer to an online account or whatever else, none of which I should have to do on my computer. But what they're doing now is uh, rolling out their new version of the ISO, which the out-of-box experience now has removed a lot of the means they have of setting the system up without a Microsoft account and without an internet connection. So uh, what he does in here is he, he goes in and he sets this guy up. He says he enabled everything that Microsoft recommends during the setup. He says it was less work overall because there's fewer overall mouse clicks. And uh, with fewer overall mouse clicks, it was a lot quicker, a lot faster to do everything. So let's dig into what Microsoft recommends uh, or otherwise forces in Windows 11 and to see which complaints hold the most water and which can be remedied the fastest. At least three clicks in, he says it doesn't change. First three clicks, you're setting up your user language, your keyboard, your basic time zones, things like that. That's going to be universal everywhere. No big deal. And then you get to the, let's connect you to the internet without any longer to have a button say, nope, set it up offline. Nope, can't do that. No longer. Sorry. No secret, one of the most frequently searched topics is setting up a Windows 11 without a Microsoft account. They removed the common workarounds, the OBC, uh, o -O -B -E Bypass NRO, and the Start MS CXH Local Only. They got rid of those two. And uh, so this is where he says that he keeps the bootable USB of Windows 11 uh, so that he can actually, you know, set his computer up uh, without having that requirement. He says, it didn't take long to find a relatively serious issue with Windows 11, the mandatory Internet connection during one of Microsoft's more frustrating, nonsensical demands. And uh, as I've said before, I think some of these computer uh, technicians who work on these things, they should be forced to work remote in the sticks with average Best Buy computers with the internet connections you have out there in the wilderness. Uh, because they probably do things that make a little bit more sense. Because, you know, not everybody has access to the latest technology, the latest hardware, and, you know, uh, reciprocal gigabit internet, symmetrical gigabit internet. All right. Um, and so uh, when you're trying to download your micro, you know, five gigabytes of um, Microsoft uh, updates on your uh, modem that made my 33.6 uh, modem look fast <laughs> in the six, well, then, uh, you know, <laughs> you bring your computer home and you can't touch it for five days while it's downloading a bunch of stuff. Of course, if it even succeeds. So uh, there you have it. And so Windows Pro has traditionally allowed you to bypass it by connecting it to a local domain. Uh, Windows Home does not allow you to do that. So there you have. Now you can install without a Microsoft account. So they don't actually answer that. I'm not sure if he 
didn't complete the section, didn't proofread it. He doesn't actually answer the question. He says installing on previous versions like 24H2 will still allow popular workarounds. During setup, press the F, uh, Shift F10 on your keyboard, open the command prompt, uh, type the start ms-cxh local only, followed by a return key. You'll see a create user PC to this prompt instead. But he does not actually tell us if he was able to successfully do that on his build. But presumably, Microsoft said they removed these options. So I don't know outside of running a lot of these major uh, major scripts. Now, telemetry and other data collection inspire more complaints. Now, I switched to Linux because of the telemetry that you could not disable. The basic telemetry you cannot disable is basic information like when you're using the computer, the basic system specs, things like that. Now, people look at that and go, well, what's the big deal with that? Well, the big deal with that is it's my computer, it's my internet, and I don't want to transmit it. It's as simple as that. I don't need an answer beyond that. In my computer, my internet, you can't have the data. And by the way, apparently collecting all of the data to resolve problems is not actually resolving it because every single version of Windows that rolls out, we have more problems, not less. Probably because they're handing the code base over to AI, uh, which basically means we're going to have a Windows system that's going to resemble something out of idiocracy before long. But that being said, by default, Microsoft asks, asks to collect optional diagnostic data, which includes the websites you browse, the apps, and the features that you use. Of course, they do this to collect information about you, to wrap up and sell through advertisers, among other things. They also have the location turned on, which will give you features, and they have a separate location for Find My Device. So if you want to be able to have your device found, well, you also have to subject yourself to the advertisements around it as well. Location services, he says, are fine, but for the most part, but I generally use my Android phone over anything that a widget would offer me on Windows 11. See, I disagree. I do not think location services should be on at all. We have too many problems in our world. We do not need to track our location services, every little thing. And by the way, I don't give any location permissions everywhere. And by the way, I'm still functioning. And uh, I probably travel more than anybody else, being as I'm recording this on top of a mountain in a desert uh, in a van. And uh, I won't be here next week. Um, and so, you know, and I can still find the cheap gas stations without um, data Hogging applications like Gas Buddy. In fact, I'm so proud. I I, I uh, was talking to a guy at a campsite uh, last week, and he's telling me, "Oh yeah, I go on Gas Buddy." I'm like, and then I explained to him the ad trackers in there and what Allstate was doing and all this. He literally pulled out his phone on the spot and deleted it. Awesome, because you know, guys, if you're unaware, you can go into Google Maps without a Google Maps account, without sharing Google Maps to your location. You can. Pull up a little area where you're at manually in a map, you know, hopefully you know enough geography to know where you are in the country. And you can type in gas stations, even on your phone, and it will give you a chronological list of the gas stations nearest to where the map center currently is, not your location, your map center currently is, with the listing of the prices. I don't need gas, buddy. And you don't either, okay? So you don't need location services. I don't use location services on any computer. I block geolocation services inside of every browser. And uh, I'm still functioning. Somehow I can still find my way. It's just that advertisers don't know where I am. Uh, actually, I don't see their ads either because, you know, <coughs> ad block is a thing. Uh, you can still disable some of the tracking, uh, but you do have to go into the privacy and security settings later. Of course, you cannot turn off that diagnostics data, which I do not want to share. Now, Windows Recall is a different one. They do not actually have a default. You have to make a choice on this. They would love to have that choice, yes, but they got lambasted. If they had the choices, no, most people would not have it. And Microsoft is like, it's that, that meme button, you know, you have two really bad choices and the guy pushing the button, sweating, which button do you push? That's Microsoft in, in recall in the OOBE, right? Uh, choose no, and most people won't turn it on. <sighs> choose yes, get lambasted again by every privacy-focused person. Uh, and so they've left it as a radio button. You have to choose one choice. You can turn it on or you can turn it off. Right. So Windows Recall, you know, they've done the meme. Um, they, they, he does say here in the article, if you search for terminal, you actually get the terminal, which is great uh, because, you know, frankly, you need it to get your Windows system the way you want it. And this is kind of the fundamental problem. I should be able to, if I bought my computer, I should be able to say, look, I want an online account or I don't want an online account. Okay? Very simple. 
So I wanted to compare this to the uh, OOBE of setting up a Linux distribution. Now, there's a couple factors we have to mention here. Now, yesterday I did a video on Cache OS. We installed the whole thing. It took about an hour to install because it was downloading the entire system. Obviously, that system needed an internet connection. I have not tried to install Cache without an internet system, uh, an internet connection, and uh, we could probably try it over here just to see what, uh, what it does. Um, but that's installing. We want to talk about the setup. You go to the to Best Buy, you bring your computer home, and you go to set it up. What does that look like? So I want to spend a little bit of time just having a look at that. So we're going to go over to a virtual machine over here. And uh, what I did here is on this one here that says Linux Mint 22.1, this is actually LMDE. I just didn't change the name of it. What we're going to do, though, is I'm going to disable networking. So we'll go ahead and turn off networking. And so this virtual machine does not have an internet connection. So hopefully this will still work. I didn't actually test it, but let me walk you through the onboard experience of setting up a Linux Mint LMDE. So we're going to start the system here and we're going to let it boot into the graphical user interface. Those errors there are because we're running a virtual machine. Here's our Linux Mint startup logo. And here we are. So here's your initial setup. Let's get started. Welcome to your new computer. So we're going to start by choosing our uh, language. So English, we're going to start by choosing our time zone. So it's pre-selected here to New York and choosing our keyboard model. Okay. Those are the same things we get in windows. All right. Uh, now we just need to give it a name. Let's call it L M D E uh, L M D E. And let's go ahead and give it a password. I'm going to give it a super secret password. It's definitely not one, two, three. And uh, I'm going to require my password to log in. And there you have it. Install. Okay, so now it's simply adding the user to the system. It's setting the locale for the user. And now it's looking at apt. And let's see. Oh, it doesn't tell us anything about the internet connection. That's nice. It's cleaning out the OEM configuration. And it's uh, getting itself all set up, basically rebooting itself. And now we're on our login screen. Look at that. It didn't even pester us about an internet connection. Go ahead and enter our super secret password. And here we are. Here's just your basic welcome screen. Let's go. Set up your desktop colors, snapshots, multimedia codecs. And you can have a look at my whole video on setting up our... Um, uh, setting up a, a Linux Mint system. We're not going to do that here. Uh, now, the small screen size is just, again, we're just on a virtual machine. So we just drop into display settings and we'll just jump that back up to the correct screen resolution. And bingo, we're good. All right, so there we have it. We just set up a Linux Mint computer without an internet connection. We weren't pestered for anything. Uh, let's see. Let me see if I can turn on internet without shutting the whole system off. I'm yeah, it looks like I cannot turn the internet back on without shutting the machine down, which is just fine. All right, so um, basically we just set the system up. We were not pestered to enter an account. We were not pestered to get on the internet. We were able to get the system up, and now we can use our system. Um, and we have various tools, functions, office suites, all sorts of things like that out of the box on this system. So I tried briefly the Arch system, the Cache OS. It's not working with my virtual box. Um, my virtual box is a little out of date. So uh, I can't tell you one way or the other. I tried it with and without internet, uh, just wouldn't work at all. So that one I'd have to try. But hey, at least the Linux distribution, I recommend Linux Mint does work just fine on the OOBE without an internet connection. And I have installed it in the past also without an internet connection. It just doesn't give you the option to update packages during the install. Means you have more to update when you get it finally connected, but in no instance does it have the, even the ability to create an online account or force you into one uh, as far as using the system. You can, however, still sync your online accounts if you have a Microsoft account, Google account, or hey, even better, a Nextcloud account. You can sync those into Linux Mint without any problem, but that does not impact your user login. So those are some of the frustrations people have. They are forced to have an internet connection. They are forced to have a Microsoft account. Microsoft is actively working against these factors. And this is really why there's still a billion PCs still running Windows 10, even though half of them could be on Windows 11 if people wanted. Let me know your thoughts. Uh, why don't you like Windows 11? Let me know in the comments down below.